Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, get the 12 and 12 group as well. Uh, they will be sharing their experience with steps 4, 5, 6, and 7, which are... Number four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Number five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. With that, I turn it over to Duncan. Hey, everybody. My name is Duncan, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Duncan. And my sobriety date is August 25th, 2008. My home group's Bowie Friday Night Speakers Meeting. I have a sponsor. I sponsor other guys. I've been through the 12 steps. And I have a God of my understanding. And as a result of those things, I can be happy and sober when I choose to be. And um, I liked what Emily was talking about. Because <clears throat> I was expecting to come in to Alcoholics Anonymous and be fairly miserable, but just less miserable. Um, and in thinking a, a little bit about um, kind of four through seven over the past Several months since Chandler asked me to speak, uh, you know, I I really started to get in touch with how incredible it is that I'm eligible to be happy and sober by virtue of these like counterintuitive things. Like I don't, on my own power, I don't go from I'm really mad at you to it must be rooted in fear. I should ask for God's help. You know, like. <laughs> That is really counterintuitive, and I promise you I never would have come up with that on my own. And um, and in getting in touch with that a little bit, like how lucky am I to be a part of this program where it's, it's, it was handed to me and I chose not to accept it for a while. And then it was handed to me again, and I'm like, okay, I'll try it, and it works, you know. And like, what a deal. And so every once in a while I get in touch with that, and... Um, and I, you know, I'm really grateful to be a part of this thing, and I'm glad to be asked to speak today. Um, and I'm looking forward to stopping speaking so I can hear Barb and Winslow. Um, but so with, <laughs> so with, with, I appreciate that. With four through seven, um, my first, so it's a process, right? Um, step four for me, the initial time, um, was it was huge, but it was not so much where like the rubber really hit the road as far as the transformation of, and re- relief from defects of character. Um, I am five years, a little over five years sober, and I've done like three and a half fifth steps personally. Like, so you can tell how sick I am. Um, and that the half fifth step was kind of like an emergency fifth step that I needed to do. Um, but it's, it's been really powerful, um, and I've had the chance to, to hear some fifth steps, and it's been really cool to, to pass that on. Um, so for my first fourth, the biggest thing was just being willing to do it. You know, I'd, I had an idea that I might have a problem with alcohol since I was really young, um, and I first was exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was uh, in my late teens, and it was when I was 25 that I first decided to get a sponsor and try to do the fourth step. And doing a fourth step was like the execution of the third step as far as turning things over. And so just having done it was big. And starting to look at, at my my part, that fourth column, was huge. Like it's not that I had never told – there was some there was some stuff on my inventory that I hadn't really shared with a lot of people, but I'd shared the stuff with at least one other person. And I'd been through therapy – uh, at the behest of school and uh, municipalities, I'd, I'd been through therapy and, and counseling, and I talked through that stuff. But it was like I'd never had a fourth column where I was like, "So what's my part in this?" You know. Um, so that first time, it was powerful just to start to conceive of there's there is a my part in this. Um, and and going through that fifth step, the real power was having a guy who was completely unperturbed by everything I was saying. He did not care. He'd done a lot of it. He had, I, I, you know, he identified with it, and he gave me some of his experience as far as some other ways that I could be at the root of some of this stuff that I was upset about and keeping in the way of me and usefulness to other people. And 
at the end of that, he said, okay, I want to go hike the Appalachian Trail. Uh, like, like not immediately, but there was a period of about a month. And after that, he, like, he, it was one of his things, like his, his bucket list was to hike the whole Appalachian Trail. And it had, it had been set up and he was ready to do it, so he left. And so, <clears throat> I spent two months under my own direction working on six and seven before getting a new sponsor. And I got insane pretty quickly. Um, just like weird and unpleasant to be around and, Confused about how to do the steps, but just like asking in a general way, I wonder how I do six and seven. And um, it's incredible how how I can just quickly forget the basic stuff that I know. You know, like I know I need a sponsor, but as soon as my sponsor left and I had, you know, eight months, seven months sober, I was like, I think I got this for a little bit. I'll wait and find like the right sponsor. Um and and luckily I got sick enough and was cl still close enough to the program that somebody basically screamed at me, get a sponsor. And within that week I got a sponsor and I picked back up. Did another fifth step with him um, to, to let him know you know who I am and then started moving forward. Now I did not do the relationship inventory, the relationship ideal. I did the inventory but I didn't do the ideal that it references. And the reason I didn't do an ideal is that I was in a relationship at the time. And if you're unwilling to do a relationship ideal because you're in a relationship, you may be in the wrong relationship. <laughs> and uh, so it didn't even occur to me. You know, I was just like, well, I'll just wait to do the relationship ideal. Um, and, and the way that I came back around to that was um, in the, you know, that relationship ended and that you know ended with my sponsor being involved in me like having a real extended conversation about how I'm feeling selfish and I feel like I'm not doing the right thing and the book tells me like I can't do that and get away with it like eventually I'll drink if my motives aren't pure um, and I'm, and my behavior is selfish so um, ultimately ended that relationship and then frankly just kind of coasted a little bit like I wasn't doing 86 to 88 in the book 87 8 you know I wasn't doing 10 and 11 and I wasn't staying honest with other people about what was going on. And started to get lonely being single. And <clears throat> over a period of time, I just started to engage in more and more behavior that I was uncomfortable with. And that wasn't, wasn't what a man of character would be doing and was absolutely selfish. And um, I had done the relationship ideal in the course of ending that other relationship. So I now had one. And I knew that I was not complying with it. And over a period of time, about the better part of a year, I just got more and more uncomfortable with it. And at one point, so my sponsor at the time was 74, and I called him at like 10.45 at night. And it was just like, blah! Um, he's like, it sounds like you need to do an emergency fifth step. And so we, we set up a date next week. And, um, and I went through like a really thorough accounting of everything that was going on and, you know, the columns. And, and he actually had a sponsor. He told me this was going to happen. He invited one of my sponsee brothers into it because he had some similar experience with some of the stuff I was kind of going through. And the reason I, I go through this detail is that it was I think the first really tangible kind of six and seven work was when he ultimately suggested that I go see a counselor about this stuff. Um, I was like, no. And then I, a second later, I was like, okay. And for for four months, I went and like did a group counseling thing that I didn't want to do, um, and was trying to really, you know, I was entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character, you know, and that's how I knew because I was doing something that I didn't necessarily want to do, um, and you know, it was useful just for doing it, just for going through the steps, and and you know, for me, part of that going through the steps is taking suggestions from my sponsor. And like you know, recognizing in hindsight that okay, I was I was entirely ready, and um, so I went through that process, and I I had the relationship ideal. I was staying rooted in the steps, and I felt like I was being a man of character. I was like, okay, so where is she? You know, where is my relationship ideal? And um, and it's just like I didn't meet her for another three years, and um. Or a better part of three years, and and those those years sucked. Um, I kept compromising, I kept making mistakes, frankly, and um, 
four, five, six, and seven for me in hindsight allowed me to build up like an honesty and a brotherhood with some friends that I now have by walking through that stuff and trying to be a man of character and like falling on my face and then recognizing it and trying again and um, staying honest with those guys and getting close to those guys and like, those relationships would not be possible without four, five, six, and seven. And six and seven are ongoing. Um, I was mentioning to Barb that I had to do I had to do the four columns yesterday. Um, just had a resentment that was running away with me. And um, and again, like what a gift that is that I have a tool that can say I'm mad at you. Here's here are my fears and and you know maybe this little bit of righteous anger I got to let that go. This, you know the dubious luxury the doubtful luxury of normal men. I am not normal, uh, so I, I do not have that luxury. So I need to let it go, um, and th- that is that is incredibly freeing, and and that is again not not the way I live naturally. Um, and so, you know, the the biggest areas for me that like I've been useful it seems in in sponsoring guys and you know the big stuff for me was really more on the being really selfish in relationships kind of stuff. And, and looking, looking for the wrong stuff to fill that God-sized hole. And um, my my experience is that as a result of you know kind of using the great motivator of pain and trying to open myself up and trying to you know be better with step work and be better with honesty, um, I ultimately became eligible for a pretty awesome set of relationships. You know. And um, so I ultimately did meet her. And, and what was cool about meeting her is that, like, there was pretty little concern because I had the ideal and she kind of fit the ideal and I was getting all nervous about it. And, and my sponsor uh, now gave me the guidance to just pray that, you know, if it's, if it's his will that I'm, that I'm with her, then it, then it happened. And if not, that it end. And I prayed that. And it was hard to pray that. Um, and, and you know, we're now engaged, and I know that I can be faithful to her. And, and I'm not sweating it, and I'm still really selfish. I'm still, she can tell you and my friends can tell you that I'm working on this stuff, six and seven, right? Um, but I have hope and I have faith that, that if I do this stuff, um, I'm I'm not a slave to these defects of character. I'm not going to be judgmental, selfish, fearful, uh, like rageful. Like you know, I, I have a shot at being in a healthy relationship with with God and being in a healthy relationship with all you people and being useful to you in some way. And that is not how I naturally feel about anything, you know. So it's just it's a really powerful deal. I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet now. And uh, thanks for letting me share. Yeah, right there. My name's Barb. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Barb. Thank you for sharing. It was good to hear you. I talked uh, about the insanity in the first panel uh, in my sobriety, the first three years of my sobriety. Going into my fourth and fifth step, when I was sober in my first year, I did a fourth and fifth step in my first year with my sponsor. It wasn't searching, it wasn't thorough, it wasn't honest, I didn't take a lot of time with it. I did it because I was watching other people get up for their one year anniversary and what I always heard was, you know, and I did my fourth and fifth step with my sponsor and everything has been great since then. And I'm an alcoholic and I don't want to be outdone by anybody not even another alcoholic. So I decided to do a kind of sort of fourth and fifth step so that I could get up on my one year anniversary and and say these wonderful things. And I did that. And I remember that night because the night of my fifth step with my sponsor, who I didn't trust, had nothing to do with her. It was all about me and my lack of trust in women. I put an hour time limit on that. I was That was predetermined. It was going to be one hour. I had a migraine headache that night. And all I did was go to her house and whine and bash 
um, who was my husband at the time. And needless to say, I didn't go on with the steps. I didn't feel better. I didn't feel great after that. And just kept going on and living in that insanity. So fast forward after that was my first year going through all that for another two years and getting desperate enough with that step Nazi sponsor. When we got back to the fourth and fifth step, which I knew was coming around again, it was thorough and it was honest. And, and I was willing to do it. And she gave me some really good suggestions because it was hard to start writing. It was so hard to start writing everything down. And she says, well, why don't you start with the easy part? Start with the resentment list because you know who you, you're mad at. And she said, just say a little prayer. Take about 20 minutes each evening, just a little bit at a time. Not the whole thing. Don't try to do a novel. And each night I would go home and I would write a little bit. And I remember when I started, I started with that resentment list. And I remember starting with my mom. And I was writing those resentments, you know, because I knew them all. Everything she did, everything I was mad at. And each night when I came home to write some more, I would go back and review what I had already written. And I started looking at it. And I remember saying, this isn't right because I'm supposed to be taking my inventory. But I'm taking her inventory. But it's supposed to be my inventory. But I'm taking her inventory. And I realized I was taking my inventory. Because all the things I resented in her and all the things I saw was me. And I was doing exactly the same thing. And it was the first time I ever realized that. You know, when I remember coming into AA and people said to me, you know, if you see something really great in someone, be grateful because the flip side of it is you've got that quality. And at the same time, if you see something you really hate in someone, you better take a good look at yourself because you've got that defect as well. And it was the first time I was coming face to face with the enemy when I, was, when I actually got to this fourth step and I was honest about it. But I followed through and I went through with it and, you know, and... In the weeks leading up to that, I was already talking to my sponsor, talking to her all the time, crying and sobbing and getting everything out. And I thought the fifth step was going to be so easy. And I got there, and I just sat there, and I just started crying all over again. But I was able to get all this stuff out that I had never shared with anyone. I knew God knew what I was doing. That wasn't my issue, but telling another person. That was the big issue for me, was getting that honest with somebody and not being judged for it. And, and, of course, she didn't judge me. And I would let out the first thing, and then she would share something from her fifth step. And that made all the difference in the world to me because I thought, okay, I'm, I'm like the rest of you alcoholics. You know? And um, I got through that fifth step. And she had suggested, you know, what it says in the big book, go home, take an hour, read the first five, first five proposals, go and do six and seven. And, and quite honestly, I went home and I took a nap. I was exhausted. At that day. It was a couple hours doing that inventory. I was. I was exhausted. But I got up and, and I thought about the first five steps. And I thought, you know, and at that time I thought six and seven were as quick as they were to read in the big book. Um, but I do remember I was meeting my sponsor at a meeting that night, and I was driving to the meeting, and all these character defects, you know, all these shortcomings had come up in this, this step, you know, and I was face-to-face -face with them. And I started this argument in the car, and I was the only one in the car. Uh, but I'm arguing and I'm yelling at myself by the time I get to the meeting. It's like, I am sick and tired of living my life this way. And that's when I realized I was entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. That doesn't mean that I don't have them anymore, because I do. I always say I have every last character defect I had when I walked into these rooms, and I can assure you they are in perfect working order, and I can draw them like a gun. And sometimes I choose to do that. More days than that I choose not to, and I honestly believe that's one of the main reasons I'm still sober today. You know, the things I could get away with 
the way I acted when I first came in as a newcomer, if I tried to act that way today, I'd pick up a drink. The longer I'm sober, the less I can get away with, the more my conscience kicks in. Now, those character defects of mine, they still fly out. It happens all the time. I think the only difference is, is that I don't stay with them as long. You know, they catch up with me a lot quicker. That guilt sets in a lot faster. Um, before I got sober, I remember where I was at work. Wherever I was at work, I was the witch of the office with a capital B. Okay? And I always wanted to get ahead, but I couldn't do it on my own. So I felt it was my job to go to your boss and tell them everything you were doing wrong. And I did that. You know, that's the kind of person I was. And uh, I felt totally justified in doing things like that. Um, lying. Love to lie. Gossip. Character assassination. Still a big win for me. I'd like to say I don't do those things anymore, but that would be a lie. You know, I can be at work. I can get sucked in so easily if I'm not on good spiritual grounds. You know, like somebody at work, there'll be an email and somebody does something really stupid and someone says, listen to this email, or I'm the one saying, get, get this, you're going to love this email, here's how dumb this is, and just broadcast it out. And that's nothing more than my lack of self-esteem and my ego battling each other saying, you know, look, they're dumb, I'm not. And that's all it is. And, you know, I used to, there's something somewhere in the big book, I'm paraphrasing, it said, I was always judging myself on my intentions, but everybody else was judging me on my actions. You know, and uh, my actions weren't so great. When I was out there, there are times today where my actions are not so great. But I have other steps that I can go back and make amends for them. And I have to say that I'm wrong. Um, that first marriage, it didn't work out. And a couple years later, I met somebody else in the program. And if you want to see if you still have character defects, just put two alcoholics together. <laughs> and we have them. And I had someone not too long ago say, Oh, oh, I can't imagine you and Winslow ever arguing. And I just thought that was the funniest thing I ever heard. And I'm like, yeah, we're real people too. You know, um, but I will say more, more than anything, we don't get in a lot of arguments. We try to stay out of each other's programs, which is very important. Um, sometimes it can get very quiet. You know, he, he won't argue. And, and, and I don't argue anymore because we're like both go for the jugular vein, you know, it's like, you may hurt me, but I'm taking you down with me. That's how I argue. Um, so I found it's really best not to, not to go there. So it can get very, very quiet in our house. Um, and I can go to, you know, and, and, and I know that I am the cause a lot of times because I can go from sane to crazyville in three seconds flat. I can still do that today. Um, I've had a lot of incidences where I've done that. Um, this past Christmas, I don't even remember what I was upset about. You can ask him after the meeting. I don't remember. I was upset about something, and um, I, he had gone out somewhere, and, and you know my character defects are flying, and, and I remember I was just, just so mad, you know. And it's like I don't like to break something, but I don't break things because I really like my stuff. So I don't break things because I know that's really stupid because I have some nice things today. And um, I was so mad. And I look around in the kitchen and some of us, somebody had given us a box of Russell Stover candies. They're in the box with the wrapper. And I just took the box and whacked it on that island in the kitchen as hard as I could about ten times just cussing up a storm. I sat down. I felt better. You know, and... Um, and then, then the next night at my home group, I think we were um, 
on step six and seven, and I shared about that and, you know, just how fast I can go to crazy. And if I were to stay in that mode, how fast it would take me to a drink. And one of my friends said that, that he sponsors said, yeah, Winslow leaned over and said, I wondered what happened to those. Because he had opened them after that. And he, you know, and he thought maybe they were just, you know, they just broken apart or something. So. <laughs> but, you know, that's my character defects, and, and they still come out. But I'm not willing to pay that price every day. You know, I cannot afford to pay that price every day and stay sober. Um, one thing I've learned over the years, you know, with the privilege of sponsoring women, for several years sponsoring women, I thought I had to be a perfect sponsor, that everything had to be great, that I had to put on this front that my whole life was amazing, and you too can have this one day. <laughs> and... You know, when I, I learned that the women that I sponsor will tell you whatever I'm going through, I'm going to share it with them. I'm not trying to be better than someone I'm sponsoring. I'm just another alcoholic. And if I'm going through something bad, I'm going to share that with you. And sometime I'm the one picking up the phone crying, calling someone I sponsor. It doesn't have to be just a one-way street. And when I first started Doing that, I felt really bad about that. I thought I was doing it wrong until when one of the women I sponsor said, you know, the best thing about you being my sponsor is is that you tell me what you're really going through and then you allow me to go through it with you and I get to see how you get to the other side. And that's, you know, that's what one of the things I've learned to do in AA. Um, you know, I get up every morning and I ask God to remove my character defects so I can truly be the person he's always intended me to be. And the first suggestion my first sponsor ever gave me in AA when I was ready to get started, she said, why don't you just try to concentrate on being a nice person today? That doesn't come easy for me because that means I have to think about you. You know, and truth be told, I'd rather think about me. Because I'm selfish, I'm self-centered, I'm an alcoholic. So I have to get out of myself and think about you. And when I'm doing that, when I'm giving back to AA, when I'm staying involved, when I'm sponsoring women, when I'm in touch with my sponsor, when I'm involved in my home group, if, if, whatever my, if I'm involved in service, whatever it is I'm doing at the time, you know, my character defects are you know, pretty much kept at bay for the most part. But you know, every morning I have to to ask God to take them away, I cannot remove my character defects. You know, it's just like I couldn't make myself stop drinking. You know, that comes from a power a lot greater than me. So, thank you. Turn it over to Winslow. Now, I love four, five, and six, and seven. I, in our program, it tells us that uh, the purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and those about us. I think when we get into four, five, and six, and seven, we'll start to realize after a period of time that it's our job to fit ourselves into the world and not the world's job to fit itself into us. I didn't want to do step four. And I think there's a correlation in there, too, between the amount of faith that I have in God and my willingness to do the fourth step. Back then, the first time around, I, was, I didn't have much faith. I was I was only sober a few months. I, I was living in, uh, <laughs> I guess it is. Hello? No, it's not. Here we go. Here we go. The movable mics. Is that better? Yay. Okay, now you can hear me. Okay. All right. Early on in the fourth step, I didn't want to do it. I could read ahead. I could read ahead, and it said that after the fourth step that I was going to have to share this stuff with somebody else, and I didn't want to do that. I really do believe, as I said before, that God does work in our lives without our permission. My current sponsor always says a lot of times when things happen to us, we ask the question, is it odd or is it God? And there was one particular morning after I got thrown out of my house, I moved to Canton. And I moved to Canton before Canton got pretty. Uh, and I shared a little apartment with some cockroaches. And, and there was a very wild neighborhood with everything going on 24-7. 
And I used to go on Sunday morning. I used to go up to the old 857 Club, and I and I went up there. They used to serve breakfast up there, and and I was sitting there trying to figure out how to how to eat my breakfast this particular morning. And I was there with my sponsor, and and in walks Dave D. A lot of you guys know Dave, and and he was with another guy uh, by the name of Tony M. And and they'd both been out. They'd come in with me. Uh, when I first started getting sober, but they decided they wanted to go back out again. And Dave walked in, and half his face was paralyzed. His jaw was hanging down, had this patch on his eye, and he just looked horrible. And then there was my friend Tony, and Tony had two black eyes. He'd been down on the block the night before and gotten rolled. And I looked over at my sponsor, and I said, what happened to them? He says, ah, they couldn't get honest. I said, wow. That meeting that morning happened to be on the fourth step, and the guy did a terrific job with it. I went home after that meeting. I was scared to death. I wrote a fourth step. <laughs> I spent the whole day there. I just wrote everything I could write. I, I followed the big book. I, 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 I did it exactly the same format as the big book told me to do it. And I did the best I could. I believe, though, that when we come into Alcoholics Anonymous, we do the very best we can with what we have left. I also believe, too, that my faith and my belief in the God of my understanding, if it is sufficient enough to overcome the insanity of the day, then it's big enough for that day. And this is designed to grow with us. So with that said, I, I've done more fourth and fifth steps the longer I've been sober. And at first I was scared to death to do it, but I did the very best I could and I left some stuff out. Fear will do amazing things. Pride and fear will do amazing things and it's about removing these things, but the thing was is I couldn't deal with them at that time because my faith was weak. And so then when we got to do the fifth step, I made an appointment to do the fifth step with my sponsor and I went down to visit with him and, uh, and it's always kind of funny. In our step there, it says we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being. It puts God first. Well, God's all forgiving, so God will forgive me. It's not too hard telling God, because God already knows. Now, dealing with the absolute truth about myself to me, now that gets a little bit harder. Because that means that I have to actually look at me and say, I did that. And I can't hang it on anybody else. There's a book I was reading not long ago. It got to the fourth step. And the vet opens it right up and says, it is your fault. Get over it. <laughs> kind of takes all the edge off everything. Well, gee, I'd like to blame right now. No, no, it's your fault. No, you did it. Or you reacted. And no matter what it is, it's still me. And then see, the thing is I have to deal with that truth about myself as much as I can at the time. I believe if we hang around this program long enough that things that we leave out will continue to come back and get us. It just happens that way. But then I had to admit it to another human being, and I didn't want to do that. You see, like Barb had said before in the earlier session, I'd never been accepted anywhere in my life. I didn't like people. I didn't know how to fit in. I didn't, know how to, I didn't understand anything about any kind of a social sort of a network. I just didn't do those things. And now I come to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and you people accept me for what I am, and yet I have got to tell somebody in these rooms just how bad I hurt people. And I did it, and I knew I did it. A lot of people talk about their blackouts, and they say, well, I don't remember a lot of stuff I did. Well, I remember almost everything I did. I don't remember the events so much, but I remember the hurt. I remember going in and going home and seeing the pain on my children's face. I remember what it's like to take them and take, make them go hungry because I wanted to drink. I remember all the harm that I did. And now I've got to share with somebody that I did that. Well, I had trouble doing that. I did the best I could. Once again, I did the very best I could, and I left out some of the worst stuff because I don't want to be judged. Well, I went on, and it was suggested to me at that time that I need to go home and I need to do six and seven that night. Well, I read it in the book, and I read the paragraph or two, and I read it, and I thought, well, what comes after this? 
Maybe I just didn't get it. It's only a paragraph in the big book, so what did that really mean? And I, and, and I was to find out that what that meant is this, that step six is one of the gutsiest steps I believe there is. Here I am in my, a guy likened it to this one time, and I loved, I loved the way he put it. He said, liken it to this, like, liken it to a man crossing a bridge. And I cross this bridge, and I get halfway across. And I look back, and I see my old life. I see everything that I was, everywhere that I've been, and everything that I have done, and everything about who I am. And it's familiar. Granted, it's messed up, but at least it's familiar. I understand all the rules. I know who the players are, and I know how to play the game. And then I look on the other side of the bridge, and I don't know anything. I know that I've now gone to a point in my life where I've taken this belief, and now I enter into words like faith and trust. Now, what do they mean? Am I willing to cross this bridge and go somewhere where I have never been before? Am I willing, really, truly to put my life in the hands of other people? Am I willing to let go of all the things that are familiar and go somewhere that I've never been before? That's hard. I believe that's one of the hardest things we ever have to do in our life. And, and we talked earlier in your session about desperation being a hell of a motivator. That my, I can be desperate. I don't want to go back to where I was. I know what it was. I was talking to a fellow before the meeting. I remember the pain that I felt the day I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. It was reminded to me that I should never forget that pain. I should never, I don't have to relive it, but I should never forget it. Because as soon as I forget what it was like and the way I felt, and I forget the condition of what it was, what I brought into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm doomed to repeat it. So I remember it. Now, am I willing to do that? Yes, I'm entirely ready. I didn't like the word entirely because I was never entirely anything. I don't like absolute words like absolute. I just don't like them. I always want a cushion in there. I always, I'm always looking for a back door. And the sixth step doesn't give me a back door. It asks me the simple question, am I ready to do it or aren't I? And again, once again, am I ready at where I am at that point in my life? It's not the same as where I am today. At that point in my life, the pain of my alcoholism and the pain, I had not made any amends yet. My family still wasn't talking to me. People didn't like it when I was around. I didn't have all that comfort, so I was entirely ready to have God remove whatever it was that stood in my way. And then step seven comes in and it says, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. What is humility? Humility is, again, it's another gift. We can't get humble. I don't know about anybody in here, but if I go in there and I love, I love to listen to people in meetings say, well, gee, I'm trying to get more humble. Well, how do you do that? I don't know how you do that. I can't make me humble. Life makes me humble. The actions of my life is where the humility comes in. It's a result. It's not an action. It's often said humble people don't know they're humble. They just are. And I believe it's the experience of life, and I believe that life now, and in our program of Alcoholics Anonymous, is about a series of surrenders. At first, the surrenders were very, very large. They were big. Today, maybe the surrenders aren't so big. The result is still the same. To the degree I'm wishing, willing to surrender, I grow to that same degree, too. And sometimes I'm not willing to grow at all. Sometimes I like it where I am. So I say I'm going to go on cruise control. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. You get a, you get a couple of years under your belt, and you go on cruise control. I did it until I become very, very uncomfortable. And if you asked me what I was going through, I'd tell you what it was going through 10 years ago. I'd share my story as it was 20 years ago because I had nothing new in my story because I was kind of cruising. I made the mistake one time. I, I went into a meeting in Brooklyn one night, and I, and I was telling my sponsor, this was early on, about how I, uh, how in Alcoholics, and I, I felt like I was at a point I was just kind of cruising. 
And I went in there, and just out of the blue, a guy by the name of Ray F., he comes out, and he'd been around a million years, and he said, you can only cruise downhill. And I thought, ah, he would say that. And I kind of went on for a little while after that, and I and, and I remember this was still early sobriety, and I, it is funny the way God meets us at the level of our needs. I got a good friend. His name is John C., and John's still around. He's still one of my very closest friends. And I was talking to my sponsor one day, and he says, what did you hear about John? And I said, what about John? He says, well, I just saw him walking down Patapsco Avenue in Brooklyn. He was right dead in the middle of the street, and he was kind of weaving in and out between the lanes of traffic. Drunker than he, drunker than a skunk. He said he was all fouled up. I said, wow. I said, well, what happened to John? He said, well, he left something out of his fifth step. He said, ah, oh, no. So I took my inventory again and I called my sponsor up and said, we never guess what happened. <laughs> I think I might have left some stuff out of my fifth step. And I made another appointment with him. And then there was a pain. There were things that I wouldn't share with another human being. I was prepared to talk, not so much actions, but the way I treated people. And I had to share the most hurtful things about me as I saw them at that time. And then I've come back years and years later, and the same thing seems to happen over and over again. It's the longer I'm sober and the more that I pray and the more that I surrender and the more that I try and apply the principles to my life on a daily basis, I start to realize the degree that I hurt people. You see, at first my whole life was I always looked at everything from my point of view, and then somewhere in sobriety that flips on us. I don't seem to know when or where, but it flips on us, and all of a sudden I have to wake up, and I have to start looking at my life from your point of view and not my point of view. So when I look at my relationships with people in the world, I try and do it with a little bit of empathy and say, what did I do to that person from their side, not my side? And then life gets very real and I start to get much more quiet. I have to start to watch the conversations that I have people. I got a little thing on my computer screen and I picked it up off of a, out of a book I read. And I ask myself these questions. Is it true? Is it kind? And is it necessary? And I try and remember those things when I start to share with other people about what's going on. Our character defects, and I have to believe, I have to ask, ask myself this one question. In the seventh step, we ask God to remove them. Do we believe that he can? Another thing comes in here, now I do, believe, do I believe that God can remove them? Well, he removed the obsession to drink. That was the worst defect I had, and it's gone. Can it return? Yes. But if I continue to apply principles in my life, will it return? Probably not. It hasn't returned in a long, long time. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I couldn't complete a sentence without at least three or four cuss words. It's extremely rare, rare that you'll ever hear a cuss word out of my mouth, in the, rooms or, in the rooms or out. As Barb said, I get quiet. I don't get angry. I never get angry. Where did that go? You ever do that all of a sudden? You realize and, you, and you're, and you're gonna, in a relationship or in your daily life, you go after one of your defects, you reach into your magic bag, and it's gone? And I'm saying, wait a minute. I'm supposed to really start getting angry. But I'm not angry. Sometimes we don't react the same way we do. I believe in, over the period, period of time that starts to happen. Are some of the defects still there? Yes. Do I still have fear? Yes. Do I still react to that fear? So that's a correlation of how much faith I have in the God of my understanding in his ability to remove them. I have a choice. I have a choice every day that I wake up whether or not I want to act on these things. Some days I do, some days I don't. I heard somebody say one time, sometimes you wake up in the morning, you're just ready for bear. Some mornings we are. And I'll wake up, nobody can say anything nice or say anything right. Because I just made up my mind that morning that I'm going to be unhappy. And I'm going to transmit that to everybody I know, because if I'm unhappy, darn it, you're going to be unhappy too. <laughs> because I don't do anything alone anymore. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the same thing, it holds true, too, if I wake up in the morning and I go out and I start saying good morning to people. I don't like saying good morning to people. I don't like talking to people. Uh, so I, I go out and I make an effort to stick my hand out. You people in Alcoholics Anonymous taught me how to do these things. You taught me how to stick my hand out when I didn't want to. You taught me how to share when I didn't want to. I have to take the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, apply them the best I can one day at a time from where I am. And I think it's so important to say I can't transmit something I don't have and I can't transmit from a place that I haven't that I haven't gone yet. It was hard, you see, because early on in sobriety I wanted to live by your sobriety and not my own. We all have our own journey. And in that journey where it's going to unfold the way it's supposed to. And for me, that seventh step, I love the seventh step because it continues to surrender. And that's why I find it all is. A lot of people disagree with that. I, I am not inspired. I am motivated by pain. When something gets uncomfortable enough for long enough, I will let it go. But I won't let it go a second before I'm done with it. But then I also have to believe this. And I believe that when I'm ready to let it go, absolutely. And in how it works, it says absolutely. Another one of those words I don't like. But when that happens, then it can be removed. I wonder often why I go through my life and I carry these defects. Some of the same ones I brought into the rooms, some I've had my entire life. And then I get mad at God and say, God, why haven't you taken that one? And the answer is always the same, because I haven't let go of it. Because I, it's a known, because I'm afraid to walk into the unknown. Who will I be if I let go of this? Because the defect defines me. And if it no longer defines me, then I no longer know who I am. And that's tough. It's kind of a thing a guy told me a long time ago, and I love it on 6 and 7, because I, I, this was shared from a, from a friend of mine many years ago. And it was more of a challenge than anything else. And he said this, he said, He challenged me, he said, when you go home, listen to the sounds of your house. When you walk in, listen for the profanity, listen for the anger, listen for people being disagreeable. And he said, if your house sounds the same way it did a year ago, then you're not growing. He said, just pay attention to what you say and what you do and how you interact at your most personal levels. It's difficult. Many of us come into Alcoholics Anonymous and we, are, we try to be, it early on, I try and be three different people. I try to be the person that I am in Alcoholics Anonymous. I try to be the person I am at, at, on my work. And then I try and be the person I am in my own life. Well, that's just taking my barroom tricks into Alcoholics Anonymous. It's nothing different. Guy told me, he says, if you're looking for balance in your life, put God in your center. Balance will find itself. It's important for us to be who we are all the time. And that is a challenge. As Barb said, too, just try and be a nice person. And how do we do that? I only believe that we can really do that through these surrenders that we find in 6 and 7 and asking direction from God of our understanding through 11. That's kind of the way I do it now, and uh, and so far it works. And the thing is, the joy is I watch people that are ahead of me that have been around a long, long time, and and, and these folks, I, I look at their peace, and I look at their serenity, and I always say, well, I want that. Well, how do they get that? They do it through the application of the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous into their life on a daily basis. And we grow. It's kind of like this. God takes care of the growth. We take care of the surrender, and then we do pretty good. Yeah, I think it's bad enough out of me, too. Thank you. Are you making faces at me? <laughs> All right, so uh, we do have a couple minutes for questions. We've got about 10 minutes till we break for lunch. If anybody out there has any uh, questions, I'd like to ask the panelists about the steps. Anyone? I guess everybody's thinking about lunch. Oh, there you 
think the question was, how do you uh, direct a sponsee through six and seven? When I'm working with a woman, you know, it's, there's the initial going through six and seven, but for me it's an ongoing thing when things come up. Um, I just like to talk to them about the character defect and try to find get down to the cause and condition, um, the why, you know, the fear, you know, what motivated them, and just try to relate my experience because chances are if someone is going through you know, a character defect. I, I've probably done it before, too. So I try to stick with sharing my experience with it. And if somebody's going through something that's causing character defects and I have no experience, I know a lot of people in AA that have, and I will point them in the direction of somebody that would probably be a big help to them. Anybody else? All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.